Hello, let's get started. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for our keynote speaker. So for those of you that are just now joining us, my name is Tamara LeBeau, and I am the current president of Baynet. So often when we are planning our annual meetings and looking for a keynote speaker, we gather ideas from our membership. Well, Karen Snyder is one of our Baynet members who helped us out with ideas this year, so we have invited her to introduce our keynote speaker. Karen is currently the director of the Cushing Library at Holy Names University in Oakland, but you may also know her from her blog entitled Free Range Librarian. Thank you for your great ideas, Karen, and without further ado, I will turn the time over to you. Thanks. Hi, welcome. Um, I am, of course, patting myself on the back for my excellent work as Nicole's campaign manager. It was a tough race, closely contested, but um, <laughs> um, it's, it's really my great pleasure to introduce Lee Rainey, founder and director of the Pew Research Center's Internet and American Life Project. He founded it in 1999, a time before Facebook, before YouTube, before iPads. Um, he is also a co-author of Up for Grabs, The Future of the Internet, and um, before the Pew Project, he was the managing editor of U.S. News and World Report and uh, after a period of covering politics and editing the magazine's national and science coverage, he's co-authoring a book for MIT Press about the social impact of technology, and the working title is Networking. Pretty good title. Here's a few more things I found out about Lee as I peruse the networks. Um, there are, um, in EBSCO, uh, Academic Search Complete, there were 22 references to Lee Rainey and three, 385 to Pew Internet. That's Academic Search Premier, sorry. Uh, he has 3,442 Twitter followers. He has 222 friends on Facebook. If you Google Lee Rainey plus zombie, you get 2,630 entries. <laughs> With Vampire, it's 2,620. With Osama bin Laden, it's 1,670. With Librarian, it's 19,600, which is surpassed only by Lee Rainey Kittens at 107,000 results. <laughs> I found out also that his first name is Harrison, and by doing a reverse date sort, sort search in EBSCO Academic uh, Premier, I, I found a 1987 article which showed that Lee has a lot in common with librarians. We all, a lot of us, especially in the Bay Area, uh, are very proud of our history of uh, fighting for um, free speech and the right to read. And we have models such as Zoya Horn, who, who um, went to jail rather than turn over public records during the uh, Sh Sh Chicago 7 trial. Uh, Lee Rainey once briefly worked for Daniel Patrick Moynihan, but quit when he was asked to lie, um, with launching an alternative and wonderful career. So it's um, my uh, great pleasure to introduce Lee to, and, and, to, uh, and to be able to sit and tweet through this session through what I know will be a wonderful and entertaining and informative talk. Thanks very much. I keep warning people about their digital footprints, and wow, there I am, <laughs> zombie and all. I, I remember the first time uh, I met Karen. It was in uh, 2002 on a snowy day in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when the whole idea of blogging was uh, actually 2003. The Howard Dean campaign had already sort of proved the concept. And, uh, and, and Harvard assembled a bunch of really smart guys mostly, but Karen was in the room, and, um, and she kept saying such wonderful, smart things that I remember at least taking a mental note, if not a, a written note, uh, radical, which is a term of affection for me, uh, with a lot of common sense. Uh, and I have been a follower of her blog ever since then, and have, she has been my teacher in a lot of these things. So I was, I was thrilled that uh, she was here and was going to be introducing me, and um, I learned things about me that I didn't even know. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, one of the things uh, that she, <laughs> my little gig uh, at the Pew Internet Project is is actually described in in our literature as being a fact tank. It's not that Pew. Uh, it's it's. Um, uh, I, my funding comes from the Pew Charitable Trust, a wonderful foundation based in Philadelphia now with a, a big presence in Washington. Uh, but they fund us to do work uh, that's primary research. We go out and do a big 
bunch of national surveys of asking people how they use technology and what they get out of it and things like that. And then we write these reports uh, on our findings, uh, but we don't have an agenda driving our work. There's no 10-point Pew fix-it plan for the internet. There's no Pew internet policy on net neutrality. There's no Pew position on, on the Comcast NBC merger or now the AT&T Nextel merger. Uh, but um, we hope that by producing useful data with, a, you know, with, with an arguments based on what we find in the data, that we'll be, we will be interesting to folks like you. So when I go out and speak to librarians who I consider to be the primary, the biggest stakeholder cohort for all of our work, uh, it's a big win for, for us and for Pew Internet. So I thank Debbie Abelock for finding me, and I thank Karen for, for being nice to me. And there's another uh, thing that I got to get out of the way at, at the beginning of, of every talk I do, uh, certainly west of the Mississippi. I'm a child of the two most challenging speaking cultures in the United States. I grew up in New York, so I speak really, really fast. And then I moved halfway through my life to Washington, so I speak really, really for long periods of time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just sorry about that. I've been told about this. I've tried to get coaching in it. I just can't do it. Um, a, a wonderful librarian came up to me after I gave a speech in Pennsylvania. You wouldn't think that would be so bad, but she came up after my talk there and said, Mr. Rainey, I know what your next job could be. I said, ma'am, I'm an aging baby boomer. I don't want another job. And she said, nevertheless, what you can be is the disclaimer reader on drug ads. <laughs> So I'm sorry, I can't help myself. It really you know, cut me off if I'm going too fast. But the one thing I am going to advocate for those of you who are tweeting uh, like Karen is please don't tweckle me. It's heckling on Twitter. It's a transitive verb that was covered by the, uh, by the Chronicle of Higher Education in an article a couple of years ago warning academics who were appearing at conferences that this was occurring that in the audience, people were saying snotty things on Twitter to other Twitter followers uh, at the speaker. And these were some of the actual tweets that were covered in the article. Uh, we need a t-shirt, I survived the keynote disaster of 09. And of course, there were sales uh, you know, uh, forms uh, on the breakfast tables the next day for that t-shirt. Uh, it's awesome in the I don't want to turn away from the accident because I might see a severed headway. Uh, and my personal favorite, too bad they took my utensils away with my plate. I could have jammed the butter knife <laughs> in my temple. <laughs> so my staff follows me on social media, and if they see twackling, I will just never hear the end of it. So it's going to be kind, and especially in your reviews of this. I'm going to talk about libraries as social networks today because it fits into a much bigger social story that's been playing out for a couple of generations but has been put on steroids in the era of the internet, mobile connectivity, and the era of technological social networking. It's a story of the rise of networked individuals. And I wish I had been smart enough to think of the concept myself, but I can't. My co-author on the book that uh, Karen mentioned is Barry Wellman, a longtime social network analyst, a professor at the University of Toronto. And he talks about people now moving uh, into a, from a world of small groups and bureaucracies into a world where networks matter most, both in a personal and social sense, but also in commercial senses, and, and that's the world that we are writing about in our book, and that's the world that, that technology is so implicated in. So the big thing that's happening, there are a bunch of big things that are happening, but the, the first thing, and, and the reason I'm talking about this is because I think librarians are well served by thinking of themselves and their institutions as networked and serving people in the same capacity that nodes on networks, friends in networks, um, play in their lives. Librarians have always sort of played those roles, but I'm not sure they have that model in their head of being a friend and being a node in a network. So I'm encouraging you to be thinking more that way. And it's partly because the world is a network world now. Yeah, we still um, have our cluster of really tight friends who are a lot of family members and some very, very close friends. But a lot of our business now is done with more extensive, diverse, and wide-ranging networks. Um, networks are more influential now than they are uh, because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a coping mechanism for the stresses and strains that we are going through as a culture as more and more information, more and more contact, more and more uh, material is flying at us. So one of the things that people do in that environment is to turn to their networks 
for cues about what's most important or interesting or relevant, for assessments about what's, um, what's credible, what's not, what's meaningful and what's not, and also just as, as, a, as an audience. People now have a sense that they are actors in networks. They can broadcast or publish to those networks, and so they think of their networks as a, as a sort of forum for, for their own content creation. That's really important for them as they participate in their world. They're differently composed now than the way they used to be. Networks are bigger, more segmented, and more diverse as, as a general rule than the networks that our parents and our grandparents had. We can access many more people because they're easier to find and maintaining those relationships is a lot easier uh, because we've got these electronic means to, to publish to them uh, without necessarily having to talk to them all one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. We've got this many-to-many -many, uh, set of tools that allow us to have a wider expanse of people that we interact with, that we know, that we can call upon when we want to make a decision, when we've got something that we're going through, or when we're uh, just trying to navigate a very complicated world. And social networks are more vivid. You know, we, this is a word that's just come into being and since the mid-2000s. Social networks have been studied for generations, but we really have a much more vivid sense of them now because they are displayed in front of us by our technology. We are uh, more conscious, probably, than our parents or grandparents were about how um, our friends fit together or what our friends can do and who knows each other and stuff like that. And the big part of the story, probably the biggest part that the internet has introduced to life and then mobile connectivity added to it is that we can create content for them. That, that information sharing, content creation, media creation is a very intimate and important part of network building. Librarians are sort of already in this world. You make content, you understand content, you make uh, reference recommendations based on content, it, but it's now sort of a networking activity in a way that it didn't used to be. It used to feel like a one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many activity. Now it's, an, it's a networking activity that librarians are particularly well served in honoring. The other thing that's, that's changed in the world of networked individuals is communities themselves are very different now. And I think librarians have an intuitive grasp of this, but I want to sort of explain what I think is new um, about this, this era, just to make sure that you're networking uh, in as many ways as you possibly can. A big part of the story, of course, is the explosion of niches. Uh, there are many more kinds of groups, kinds of communities, kinds of bonds and social capital uh, that um, that exists now. Uh, you know, there's, you name it, and there's a group for it, uh, or a group against it. Uh, and and, they're, and, it, and it, it's narrower and narrower, uh, defined sometimes by passions, defined sometimes by demographics, defined by, sometimes by lifestyle. A whole host of things now are entering that picture, and so group activity is exploding uh, in this era. One of the fun things that, uh, that we've all seen is the rise of social posses. People who grab a cause or grab an interest or something like that and pursue it. You know, sometimes the, it, the, there's some, something wrong has happened and people go out on a hunt for the wrongdoer and, and evidence about what the wrongdoer has done and, and bringing the wrongdoer to justice. But you can think of anything that related to politics, social activity, hobbies and things like that. People will run down stuff in, in new and interesting ways in part because they can call on their networks to help them uh, and their networks sometimes can propagate in ways that, that, that crowds will help them solve problems and, and, and learn things. Another brand new kind of group, not a brand new kind of group, but it's, it's certainly more powerful, more vivid, and more abundant nowadays, is what my friend Susanna Fox calls just-in-time, just-like-me communities. And they're particularly evident in the medical world where people are looking for others who have gone through the exact same disease or caregiving set of circumstances that they're in. It's not, they're, they're, they're interested in finding people who are literally at the same stage of life, the same stage of the disease, the same kind of community that they've been in, the same kind of network. It's easy now to assemble networks on the fly of people who are very, very much mapping with you and your circumstances or, or the, the person that you care about and their circumstances. It's a, it's a new way to think about the assembly uh, and the construction of networks and librarians again are sort of uh, tuned to this in a way in a way I can't think of any other group being nearly so um, so competent at doing. You know how to 
call on people to get help and get resources uh, on, on your behalf. You know how to, to figure out, you know how to solve problems, and you know how to plug into people's lives when they ask for help. And then the, the content creation piece is particularly interesting um, because content creators nowadays are of a different breed from content creators in the industrial media age. If you remember back to your French history, they talked about three estates, right? The clergy, the nobility, and the peasants. In the 19th century, the British and later other uh, developing countries talked about a fourth estate, which was the um, mass media or the or the newspaper that in those days or pamphlet reporters who had a they were called the fourth estate because they had a different relationship to civic space than those other three estates. They they had a different mission, they had different narrative forms, they had a different professional callings and stuff like that. So they were a very distinct class of actors. Well, Bill Dutton, um, who's, um, who's, who's kind of like me, but he's smarter and got a wonderful perch at the Oxford Internet Institute, he, he has talked about content creators in the modern age being a fifth estate, where people who um, create blogs, who do social networking, who make YouTube videos, who in other ways contribute to the online environment, um, they have different sensibilities. They're, te they're more personal. They're more partisan. They're more passionate. They're more particular in the way that they see the world. They're not like mass media reporters in, their, in the way that they tell stories, in the way that they react to things. And, and so he said that this is bringing sort of a new media culture uh, to the commons that you guys have seen in the exhibit out there, that, there are, that this content creation class that's coming from this you know, crazy bunch of amateurs who are blogging and doing all these sort of things. They have a different uh, role in the world and a different set of sensibilities that's a new kind of group. And I, and I think librarians, you know, early on were, were appreciative of what the value of content creation was. You, you took it upon yourselves probably to be the most abundant content creators yourselves in original forms, but also to be teachers of it. I, I saw lots and lots of libraries starting around maybe 2005, 2006, beginning to have uh, programs built around social media and training sessions to help patrons uh, learn how to be a blogger, how to do a video, how to, do, how to set up a, a Facebook page and, and things like that. So you instinctively understand that this is a new kind of, of community form that is well suited to the things that you've already learned and understood uh, in your training. So that's a world of networked individualism sort of uh, at, a, at a grand level. Uh, um, let's do questions and answers throughout. So if you've got questions um, arising from things that I've already said or I'm, you don't agree with something or if you think I need to elaborate on something, why don't you raise your hand right away and, and let's, let's talk about it. And this seems a particularly good moment for a filibuster break before I get into some of our data. <laughs> uh, any, any questions so far? Yeah. Social network, you'll let me discussing social networks and teens. Uh, yes, I will, now that you've said so. It's, it's sort of a, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, it's, um, it's, a, it's a special case in a way, and you know, from a from a research perspective, of one of the most interesting edge of the story isn't the teen edge anymore. It's the over 50 edge. The fastest growing um, class of social network, um, you know, arrivees is people over age 50. And from a, again, from a social research perspective, the absolutely hysterically great thing to see is the tension in families when mom wants to friend Junior um, and learn about all those parties Junior is posting pictures on on Facebook. It's just awesome to watch these, these new norms being created in, in families on the fly. So I, I will make sure to be talking about that. Yeah, there was one other question. Yeah. Okay, well, it, it, uh, and I don't see it as either or, so let me be clear about that right, right away. Obviously, librarians uh, from time immemorial have been aggregators, and there are interesting new ways to be thinking about that now. But uh, how many people are tweeting this? They're content creators. How many people have a blog? You know, they're content creators. How many people have social network pages? You know, for my scoring, and uh, just in the way we think about it, those are content creators in the sense that they are um, sharing their stuff with at least some other people. Now, it's, with, if they've set the privacy settings pretty tight, we still consider it to be content creation because they're they wouldn't have been doing that in the pre-internet age. You don't walk around and show everybody in your network your 
diary, right? Or, or the notes that you're passing around in class. And so this, is, this feels like a different quality of, 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 of public engagement. That's, and so that's, that's what I mean by that. But it's, a, it's an important distinction that I'm glad you highlighted. And there was one other question. Yeah. Those times when you're trying to find something and you can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's that, and, and uh, there are two versions of that that I'm hearing about. Oh, it, it could, I'm sorry, I should repeat the questions uh, for those who are recording it. It's wh what about, have we looked at the, the people who are frustrated by not being able to find things, uh, which is the obverse of what I was talking about, of people finding new things more abundantly now than before. We've looked at... One version of that, um, which is a good news story if you're into community building, which is, um, I, I'm not going to remember the data, right, and it's, it's, it's a couple of years old, but we asked people, what did you do when you couldn't find a community that fit the issue that you cared about, the passion, whatever, if you went out looking for friends and you didn't find them, what did you do? The vast majority of people said, I made it myself. I set up a, a, a group site, I set up a content page, I, I started pinging people that I thought would help me do it, and so you know, the, the um, personal spontaneity that's possible in this age is a lot more readily accessible to pe people when they have these tools. There's another version, though, of, uh, of, of not finding what you want, which is a kissing cousin of information overload. It's people who kind of suspect that what they want is out there. They just can't get to it. It's just, you know, the search results are just too, uh, you know, too great to wade through, or they're not so clearly on point and stuff like that. And again, what, we, what, what I think happens in networks, and I don't have hard data to prove this, is that people ping their network and say, I have this need, help me out. And in many cases, their network will come through for them. And it's not necessarily the first order people, you know, the first tier of friends that, are, that will come through. But if, they, if somebody's motivated, they'll ping their friends about it. I mean, I, in, in, the, in the Pew Internet, there's a simple way that this comes out in our life. There are some times when we are about to field the survey. We know a subject is important, or we know that there, is, there are an ser important series of questions to ask around the impact of technology. But we're not immersed in the field. We, and we, you know, the lit review is going to take too long, or it's, gonna, it's not going to be enlightening in, in, in important ways. So we will just tweet it and Facebook it and ping our best friends in the community. Karen's gotten a bunch of these from me. Say, what, what should we ask? How should we go after it? And people who don't know us, people who are total strangers, they follow us or they've heard about us secondhand or thirdhand, will s send in stuff. And, you know, some of it's crazy and some of it's mean-spirited, but the vast majority of it is well-meaning and helpful. And, and so that's, that's more the experience that, I, that we hear about than people just sort of saying, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm so uh, unique that there's no one like me or there's nobody that, that can share what I want to share with. The act of actually expressing that need for sharing almost always brings back something, and that's what, kind of, that's what people want, too. They're not necessarily fully satisfied, but they're happier for the engagement than not. Yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. The question is a, a little bit more of the differences between the fourth estate and the fifth estate. Uh, the fourth estate, which I, you know, I'm a, as Karen told you, I'm a refugee from the, from the world of mass media, and it has a, a you know, it prizes um, a number of narratives, a number of, of framings, and, a, and, a, and an approach to the world that's different from the fifth estate. Um, it's, it's very focused on, on political and civic life. It's very focused on public uh, events of the, of the traditional kind, things that happen in public or that are, are, are meant to drive public narratives. 
Um, it's it's fact-checked and edited ahead of time uh, before it's published. It's, it's sort of in, the, the institution that stands behind it often is more important and meaningful to, to readers than the actual byline that's, uh, that's on the story. So it's, it's institutionally based. It's quite expensive to gather. Professionals are doing it who have some level of training in doing it. And it's built around a core set of narratives that are you know, long since established in the profession. In the fifth estate, it's more of a free-for-all. And, and so what people are filing isn't necessarily you know, what the mayor or what the president said yesterday. It's, um, here's, here's my reaction to what that knucklehead said or something like that. It's, it's more, or here's how that doesn't work with my life or you know, worse words than that. Here's how I, I, I think about this. So it starts being personal, and it, it almost invariably in civic um, kinds of conversations is, is starts with partisanship because the most engaged people in civic life are partisans. You know, this notion that we have that people enter civics as tabula rasa and they just want to know all the facts and they'll make smart decisions about who to vote for and what public policies to endorse. People are partisan, and they come to their partisan views through a variety of family and cultural and learning experiences. Um, but they're the ones who want to comment on public life. They're the one, you know, the blogosphere sorts pretty nicely into a red cohort and a blue cohort and, you know, shades in between and shades on the side, but it's, it's, it's more partisan that way. In many cases, it's quirky and personal. It's not, it's not, you know, journalists can't sort of comment on, you know, the, whether the breath of a candidate stinks or not, but, a, you know, a blogger will. Uh, and and, it's, and it, the norms of, of the fourth estate are, um, are pretty well established. There are certain places you don't go and certain stories you don't tell. And for, for, for fifth estate content creators, those boundaries aren't as, as well defined and are very uh, personally defined. Does that, does that make sense to you? Okay. And, of course, they use different tools, too. Um, okay, well, in the life of the pro yeah, one more question. Yeah. Well, it's 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 some of that. So uh, the question is about what are, a little bit more detail about what I mean by social posses. Um, they, they they come in a, in a variety of flavors, and I'm I'm sure people in this room will help me do these stories as we crowdsource um, my talk. Um, there was a, a, a quite famous uh, technologist from the the, the, the Valley area who uh, was lost over the desert. Right? Do you remember this this person who was a, a couple of years ago? Help me out. Yeah, flying a plane. Say the name again. Routine, not Rutan, I don't think it was Rutan. Anyway, a quite famous technologist was lost over the desert. All of his friends and the friends of their friends began using online tools to help in the, the, the formal searchers try to locate where he was and get more details about the plane that he was flying, the route he was likely to fly, the tail number, the, all sorts of stuff. So people sort of assembled on the fly to try to help find, find a comrade. There's a story that, um, uh, of a simpler sort uh, that uh, I ran across from a Toronto blogger a while ago where a, um, uh, there, an, an Acura, um, uh, a, a special piece of some sort of part of the, uh, the outside of the car, was stolen. Um, and, it, and, and there was a, the guy whose car was stolen from uh, got a hold of the security film of it and saw the license plate of the person that he thinks stole it, posted the license plate uh, of, of that person and a little bit of a description of him. And strangers are all around Toronto began to say, yeah, my Acura got stolen uh, of the same material. And yeah, this, and here's where this guy works and here's where he lives and here's where his mother lives and stuff like that. <laughs> Do you remember the guy, the Chicago Cubs fan, Steve Bartman, who caught the yeah. ball? Okay, well, it's a, a, you know, a, a social policy um, that sort of rages out of control was the people that within an hour of his knocking the ball out of the hands of the, the left fielder of, of the Cubs had posted his name, his address, his employer, his mother's name, had commented in about seven languages about what he had done. So uh, what I mean is... Um, of people assembling on the fly to do jobs. There's a, there's a great example of a, of a social posse uh, at the beginning of Clay Shirky's book, Here Comes Everybody, where he talks about uh, a stolen cell phone. 
and, and how people sort of, again, assemble on a fly to help uh, you know, a person track down the person who stole the cell phone and stuff like that. That's what I mean by, by that. And again, I'm giving sort of bad examples. On the good side are people that, that literally build a network to save a life, you know, that, that are they're rare diseases uh, where they can, they tell you what the medical literature says, they tell you what the clinical trials say, they tell you who the best specialists are, they tell you what the best hospitals are treating the disease, and all of a sudden strangers have come together to um, save a life. So they're, they're way, that's what I mean by that. Okay. A little bit more clarity on the differences between the fourth and fifth estate. Yes, there is blurring. I mean, when, when Karen and I were at Harvard talking about um, the bloggers and mainstream media, they were, they, they, the room was half divided in half. It was half from the blogging community and half from the mainstream media. And that was a very pretty, uh, not very, it was a pretty clear-cut distinction between you know, the people in the room. To, the bloggers were the amateurs, and the mainstream media were the pros. Well, nowadays, since every journalist has a blogger and a social networker and stuff, there is a, a, a blurring of that line, and there is n no longer any contempt uh, of the kind that there used to be by pro pro professional paid reporters for news organizations against bloggers because they're all doing it themselves, and they've understood the ways that bloggers can help them and amplify them. But, uh, you know, read your uh, uh, morning uh, newspaper or however you digest it, um, you know, someday soon, just seeing how many sources in that paper came from online. They, you know, reporters find their sources now of people who have blogged smartly about it or have tweeted about it or something like that. So the worlds had definitely merged. I'm talking about mostly a sensibility of publishing. What it, in, the, in the traditional media world, there are still norms and professional standards and, and sort of narratives that, that are elevated um, as opposed to others. In the, in the content creation world of social media, the, there's just a lot more stuff in a lot more ways with a lot more narratives with that sort of personal, partisan, quirky um, uh, sensibility to it. That's, that's what I mean. Okay. So the project that I run has now been doing research for 11 years about the, we started doing the impact of the internet and we've uh, watched three revolutions unfold that have changed the way that we, that we look at things and the kinds of things that we measure. So I thought I'd go through those revolutions. The first one is the internet and broadband. On our very first survey in March of 2000, we found that 46% of adults were using the internet. So the internet was already sort of well along in its adoption curve. Um, we weren't new to the party, um, uh, but we, you know, it was still less than half the population. Now it's 79 percent, and there are age differences that show up on this chart. So, you know, adults over 65, they are still not quite, uh, not quite 50 percent of them are yet online. It's a very different picture from the now 93 percent of teenagers who are online. A, 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 an important part of this story, of course, is that the Internet user population, and for us, that you, you become an Internet user when you answer yes to either one of these questions. Do you use uh, the Internet occasionally? Do you use email occasionally? If you say yes to either one of those, you're in it. Obviously, most people do both. But we, we realized early on that some email users didn't think that they were using the Internet, and we wanted to make sure that we, we counted them. Um, and by saying yes to those questions, you know, we, we watched the population grow up until about 2006, and it stopped. If you used it at work, you should have said yes. If you used it at a neighbor's house, you should have said yes. If you use it at a library, you should say yes. If you're a user, you say yes. So this is the broad picture of the online population, and it stopped growing around 2006, 2007 in the, in the adult world. Then the other question we started asking early on was about broadband connections, and we don't ask specific um, upload, download speeds. We just ask, do you have a high-speed connection? And most people know at least that. And so we now see that two-thirds of Americans have broadband at home. And it was fascinating to watch the world change from a mostly dial-up population to a mostly broadband uh, population because as people made that migration, they become became really different internet users. They built the internet more deeply into the rhythms of their life. It became the default place where they began to look for 
the things they wanted to look for in their life. It's news or recipes or finances or sports or, or whatever. The internet, uh, as, as they got a, a broadband connection, the internet became, became the first place that they looked rather than an adjunct to the paper that they surrounded themselves with in the, in the pre-broadband age. They reported better outcomes. They could more easily find the things that they wanted. Um, and they um, were content creators. You know, they, we, the, the act of having an always-on, relatively high-speed connection just encouraged people to participate. It was, it was not that hard to do. The tools got better and stuff. And so um, broadband was a big change. But again, its growth has slowed down, too, particularly uh, as in the rural parts of this country, which are much less um, um, uh, connected to high-speed connections than uh, urban and suburban areas. These are some of the things that we see in our data. I know librarians care a lot about underserved po uh, populations, and, and it's, a, it's a story that you've probably heard a lot. Uh, higher socioeconomic status folks are much more likely to be online than low socioeconomic status folks, either by household income or by educational attainment. Older people, that's the single strongest predictor. If you're over age 70, you're much less likely to be an internet user than a 20-year-old. Um, disability is, is still an independent uh, predictor of non-internet use. And Spanish, and, and preference for Spanish. When we do our surveys, we give, um, right when we get somebody on the phone, we ask, do you want to take the interview in English or Spanish? If the person chooses Spanish, they're less likely to be online than, the, than anybody that chooses English. And again, when you do statistical modeling that takes care of some of the socioeconomic differences that are inherent in that distinction, it still shows up as an independent um, predictor. So, and for broadband, af being African American, uh, apart from what your socioeconomic status is, is, a, is still a, a mile, a, a weak and diminishingly important predictor, but it still shows up uh, in the data. Um, the consequences for the information ecosystem were profound. We just get a lot more stuff. You know, we get a lot more information and it comes at us much more rapidly. The velocity um, uh, picture I'm showing here is, is interesting because it's not so much that people are getting the big stories in the world coming at them faster. In the TV and radio age, you know, people were aware of stuff relatively quickly, relatively ab abundantly. What's special about this era is people finding out stuff that, that they care about. And that relates to the valence or relevance point. People are setting up the daily me. They are, or they are setting up filters and screens and alerts and other things like that in this challenging environment so that they can bring to them the information that matters most to them rather than the information that the gatekeepers and the traditional mass media thought was in their, in, you know, they would be interested in and stuff like that, which is another difference between the fourth estate uh, and the fifth estate. And I wish I'd been smart enough to think of the term for this, the daily me, uh, but it's a, it's a term that came in the mid-1990s from Nicholas Negroponte who wrote the great book, uh, Digital Nation, I think, or something, being digital or something like that. Uh, he headed the MIT Media Lab. And the vibrance point is, is one that librarians um, have understood a lot better than most people. Media environments are just, think of the gaming environment, they're just more immersive now. They're just more fun to be in. And they're getting better and better all the time as pixels are crowding more together and we've got more bandwidth and we've got more computing power and stuff like that. And libraries have been the forerunners of thinking about how to build, uh, you know, how to gamify uh, um, a bunch of their activities and to bring teenagers um, into their communities. If they understand games and make games available, I, you know, I hear good things about what happens at libraries um, as, they, as they build games into things. And I'm, you know, I, there are a bunch of leading institutions, starting with the U.S. military and a lot of tech companies, that now think of game-like structures uh, uh, as the, the most effective way to do training. Uh, and, you know, you, you get a skill, you master it, you get a pat in the back or some other goodie, and you move up to the next level. And that's, you know, the, a ton of work now in the military and in tech companies is now built around the, teaching through these methods. And, you know, you can't see how much longer the educational establishment, establishment might hold out from this. It just is, there's a serious gaming movement too, which is now, it's not to be gainsaid. It's, it's, uh, it's an important thing. It, it tends to be um, centered in scholars in, in uh, upper and uh, higher education, but it, it will begin to filter down. It's just, it's just it works, and, uh, and people will eventually understand that. And of course, the big thing is the content creation piece. Um, uh, <laughs> 
This is how we measure it at Pew. We, 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 and we don't, you know, we, we get rough measures of all these things, and we don't tend to ask these all in the same questionnaires. But roughly speaking, it's, it's easy to say that about two-thirds of American adults and about three-quarters of teenagers are content creators of the, of the sort of kind that I've described here. The top of the list is, is social networking. We consider that content creation because people are sharing their stories and their opinions and their lives and stuff like that. The photo sharing piece is really interesting because if you isolate people who have shared photos online from the non-photo sharers, they're different social beasts altogether. They do more, they're into their groups more, they have more social capital, they are they report greater levels of satisfaction with their lives and stuff. There's something about sharing photos online that really turns people on and, um, and freaks out parents uh, <laughs> and stuff like that. Then there's uh, comments and rankings and ratings and taxonomies that people have built in there. Uh, there's still some bloggers. 14% uh, of adults do blogging. It's a number that's pretty stable for the past five or six years. And from a, uh, a, a, a phone researcher perspective, it's harder to talk to people about blogging. I mean, they, there are some people who define, self-define as bloggers. That's easy to get them to say, yes, I'm a blogger. But people who tell their life story, but they do it on their Facebook wall, that's something that I used to call blogging, but they don't. They're, they're doing a social networking thing. And so um, the function that we used to think of as a discrete function called blogging is now sort of morphing into lots of different kind of capacities for stuff. And so it's just harder to talk to people not only about creating blogs, but about reading blogs. You know, the, the software is so cool uh, that it makes it look like a high-end media site. And this merger of the professional and amateur classes, you know, when all, every reporter working for a news organization is a blogger, um, there, there isn't that pro-am distinction uh, anymore that has much meaning. We struggled with our Twitter language for a long time uh, and finally just said, we're going to ask this straight up. We, we tend not to want to uh, privilege a particular application or something like that, but we confuse people too much with our previous language. So 12% of people are uh, on Twitter. It's a number that, that has grown a little bit, but it hasn't exploded like the social networking number did um, a couple of years ago. And that's probably, you know, it'll grow a little bit more, but probably won't ever attain the, the, you know, the heights that, that it, that it um, that social networking did. And you can see, I, you know, I'm just fessing up, we don't know how to ask yet about uh, location-based services. We've asked it a variety of ways. We get answers ranging from 4% to 17%. We're trying to refine it, but it's, it's definitely coming. There are a bunch of people who are on Foursquare and Gowalla using the social, uh, the, the location services in in, in Twitter, in um, Facebook, and, and in and Google services and the like. But it's hard to get people to think about that when so many of the location applications that they're using are not necessarily known to them. You know, when you launch a map, it's tracking your location. And you don't necessarily think I'm on a location service now. And so we're going to try to to refine our questions to capture this uh, more readily. But the, the, the big story is that now in the internet era, location tended to be um, an irrelevant variable to people. They, they, when they sent off an email, they didn't care where the recipient was or, or anything like that. Location and even time mattered less. Well, now location is coming much more dramatically back into the store, especially when it's you know, our pocket devices are, are registering it. And so a new layer of information about us and about our identity and about our, our um, you know, our way of engaging the world is coming back into the story in a really interesting way, and, it, and it's content creation of a sort. So what you guys experienced as the Internet and broadband were growing was uh, a ginormous uh, disruption as the world moved from atoms to bits. People still want books. They still want printed material, but now they want this other stuff too. And so it's a challenge to your collections to figure out how to deliver to the constituencies who have always prized the traditional things you've done, plus the new constituencies who are demanding sort of new stuff in new ways. But the good news from a social networking um, perspective is that libraries do unique and special jobs um, in, so in solving some problems, starting with access divides. Uh, there's wonderful work done by the University of Washington about how people um, use... Um, technology uh, at libraries, and, um, and they were particularly focused on those who live below the poverty line and found that there was a lot of activity from, from, from uh, low-income folks that was centered in library technology use that wouldn't have been done anywhere else. Your capacity to provide computers and internet connections at libraries was really essential to people who needed it 
ranging from teenagers to senior citizens who wanted health care um, and other things, and to altruism. A lot of people are using library technology connections to do stuff for other people. Um, and, and there's a lot of altruism that sort of gets missed on the internet um, in a lot of ways, but librarians are, are, are at, at, uh, libraries are at the center of that. Um, you also, uh, as I say, are becoming more involved with, with helping people participate, teaching them the skills, show, modeling for them good ways to, to uh, participate. And again, through the University of Washington study showed that, that um, you know, there's a lot of people who are using library technology connections for social activities, for job and economic related activities, for educational upgrades or skills upgrades, and for community engagement. So that, you know, part of the story about libraries being social networks is that you are serving people who would otherwise not be able to participate uh, in this world, and, it's, and it's a, that's a social act, just in case you, you didn't think of it that way. But I'm going to argue that there's even more that libraries can do, and, and I'm not sure to what degree in the Bay Area this is an issue, but it's around the country it is. The people who don't use the Internet, and especially people who don't want, want, think about broadband, have a variety of issues about why they don't do it. For some people, it's clearly about the money. They don't have the resources to do it, and, and that's fine. But that's not the majority of non-users. It's a fifth of non-users cite price as the single greatest deterrent to them getting online. Other people just say, I don't want it, I don't need it, I don't see why it would be useful to me. They're kind of like their old familiar technologies and old familiar media sources. Um, but in focus groups that we've done with them, often what, the, what really they're, they're telling you is, I'm worried about my own skills. I'm embarrassed that I don't, I'm not with the program in, in the digital age. I don't want my children to see that I can't do the things the way that they can do them. And in many cases, they just don't know what's out there. Um, it's, it's striking um, for us to hear that they are pretty good about covering things that get a lot of media, media attention. They are well-schooled on the idea that the internet is full of predators and stalkers and people that will steal your identity and people that will blow up your computer and take all your money and stuff like that, but they don't know high quality health information is online. They don't know that the, that the best breaking news is online. They don't necessarily have a sense that they can interact with government online, that in many cases the government services that might benefit them are better um, sort of displayed for them and more easy to use online. And there's been a tremendous move in the e-government movement to port a lot of stuff over to, to, the, to the web so that people can interact, and people don't necessarily know that. So there's a, what I'm arguing here is that libraries can be thinking about um, an educational function that basically says, here's what it is as well as here's how to do it. People will need some tech support and some hand-holding on just the mechanics of going online, but also just learning where the good stuff is, that's what you guys learn how to do. And so it, I would say that there's, a, you know, there are opportunities here. I'm not, again, I'm not sure in this area there are that many people who think that way who are inhibited because they just don't know. Okay. Uh, that is the internet broadband part of the lecture. Any any questions on that? Filibuster pause number two. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, which is a story. Uh, sorry, I'm going to repeat the question. Um, she was surprised that disability is a predictor of non-internet use when her experience is that the people who are disabled are, are, are avid and, and, and affectionate users of the internet and it helps them. Um, the, the, the problem is that, um, well, the issue is that for all people who are in cohorts that are, are, are thought not to be internet users, if, if you are an internet user, you tend to be avid in the extreme. I mean, in the early days when we saw older internet users, people over age 65, they were in a small, small minority of their cohort. But when they were online, they adored it. They loved email. They loved sharing pictures with their families. They loved, when, when Skype came in, they loved having interactions on, on cheap and efficient uh, phone systems. And, and, and in many respects, um, the internet users in those cohorts were more enthusiastic more frequent, more adoring uh, in, their, in their use of the internet, but the, the, their, 
their cohort uh, showed otherwise. You know, their cohort, the, the vast majority of people in the cohort didn't look like them and act like them. So th it's, that's the same case with the disabled. We see often that uh, particularly people uh, who have a dis disability that really um, affects some major act of daily living or even chronic disease, if they are online, they're much more likely to do lots of stuff. The issue is that they're, they're in a cohort where more people don't do it than do do it. Okay, wireless uh, revolution. You know what? We're, we're getting close to the end here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip down here. The wireless revolution was really important. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll do a little bit of that just to give you our data and, and stuff and tell you how, where's the little thing here? Uh, the wireless, 57% of, um, oh, doggone. That's 50 there it is. 57% of Americans now connect to the Internet wirelessly, and we count that two ways. If you do it with your smartphone, 85% of Americans have phones, cell phones. 40-plus percent of those 80% connect to the Internet in one way, shape, or form with that handheld device. Almost everybody who has a laptop now also connects wirelessly on the go. So if you say yes to our question either about wireless connectivity on a laptop or yes that you do it with your handheld, you get counted in our wireless population. And it's more than half of the population now connects wirelessly. And they, um, they have a very different sense of, um, well, let me show you the apps data. They have, a, they, have a, they have a very different sense of, of place and presence and being with people. You might be aware of this new book that's, that's making the argument. Uh, uh, Sherry Turkle from MIT, is, her book is called Alone Together. And it talks about people who would much rather engage their networks on this than talk to the person that's you know, three feet away from them there. That, that she worries about the social implications and norms about people essentially not being present when they are physically somewhere and being very much engaged with people who are distant from them. Um, but there are other things in our data that show that it's complementary and supplementary and it doesn't take away from, from people's engagement with other people. And we'll continue to argue about the meaning of that for a long time. We've done a little work on apps. We're in the field now with the new survey on apps, so these data will be revised in about a month. 35% of Americans have apps on their phones. Oh, and 24% of them actually use the apps on their phones. So people are buying, uh, you know, we're in the early adopter stage, so people are, are buying phones with apps preloaded, and in, in some cases now iPads with apps preloaded. They don't have the faintest clue how to use them or what they mean, whether they can, they can work or not, and a lot of people still want their cell phones just to make cell phone calls, maybe to text, but a lot of them don't like texting either. And so um, the apps, you know, I know it's, the apps world is tremendously exciting in, in this part of the the world, and there's a ton of uh, energy in the technology community for it. And their librarians are going to be at the center of the argument about what this means long term. I mean, there's an argument. Wired Magazine, about 20 months ago, did a really great cover story that provoked a ton of conversation. The cover line was, the web is dead, long live the internet. And it talked about how um, the wide web, browser-based, search-oriented web was going to give way to the apps world and the peer-to-peer -peer world where people could go more directly to the things that matter to them from trusted sources that matter to them. Media companies, you know, are fevered to try to get the apps uh, in play that, so they can begin charging for content now that they have to give away for free uh, on the Internet. And so um, I don't think the wired the implication of the, uh, of the wired cover will play out. I think people will segregate their lives into certain things will be great in the web world. If you're sick, you don't want to necessarily just confine yourself to you know, a handful of sources. You want the feast. Uh, if you really want a fast reading from a trusted source on something that matters to you, of course the apps world is going to be um, uh, you know, your friend and more hospitable uh, media environment than, um, than the media world. So I think there'll be a, a segregation that takes place. Different kinds of searches will be done in, in different kinds of uh, media environments. Now, okay, anytime, anywhere. Oh, yeah, your disruption on this was, of course, your, the places where you work. Um, got uh, sort of rearranged. You know, it used to be that people, libraries were places that housed things that people came to. That was, the old, that was the whole act. It was cool that you guys aggregated it and stored it and made it readily available to people. Well, now a lot of this stuff can go out to people without them having to visit the building. That's, that's an enormous uh, disruption. But you are um, 
the, the relevance of the library as building is, uh, is, um, is something for you guys to decide, but I would argue um, that, there, that the wireless environment um, can make even more appealing some of the things that in a social sense, in a collaborative sense, in a, in a learning sense, and in a quiet sense. Libraries are still great places for solitude and for focused work and for concentrating on one thing or another. You, there's a huge debate launched by Nicholas Carr when he did a cover story in The Atlantic, Does Google Make You Stupid? And he wrote a book called The Shallows that basically said there's brain research now showing that people who, who in the life of perpetual connectivity that we have in the wireless world, their brain fires different ways, and certain synapses work, and sudden atrophy, and, and, and stuff like that. And so this is a very challenging environment where librarians can help people navigate these spaces and give them time to be contemplative and solitary and at peace if they want to be, but also libraries as collaboration spaces, spaces for, for, learn, for crowds learning and sharing and participating and stuff. So finding the balance and finding how to meet people's needs at different times of their lives is a, is a big challenge for you guys. Yeah. Right. I, I, I hear that all the time, and I'm not saying no to that. I'm just sort of saying that they're figuring out where that, that sort of place of peace and quiet or that place of, of retreat and solitude is. Maybe the librarians can think about that, or maybe that's just not appropriate anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a big move in the in the architecture community too. Yeah. People also create their own zones. We hear a lot about how the Japanese, when they get on the train, they just sort of envelop themselves and say, "Okay, I'm focused on this thing that I'm doing." And you see that, regardless of the level of noise, and I I work in a very busy library. We see a gate cut regularly, 2,500 to 3,000 a day, and people just create their spaces, put their heads yeah. on and do it. Interesting. I'll run through our social networking data really quickly, only to give you the data behind the point I made earlier. 48 percent, 48 percent of Americans are on social networking now. There are a lot of, um, uh, you know, the fastest growing cohort is, is older folks, so it's not just a kid space anymore. What? Um, What's most interesting from a social research perspective about teenage use of, of social networking, of course, it's their dashboard. It's, it's absolutely, for many kids, their Facebook page is their home page. It's what they check first in the morning. It's what they check last at night. They often will carry their cell phones to bed with them to see if any new wall postings or any new texts come in as they sleep. And they set their alarms loud enough so that it goes off and they wake up at 3 a.m. just to make sure that they haven't... Uh, um, well, you, actually, there was a wonderful term that I became aware of at the most recent South by Southwest uh, conference uh, a couple of months ago, FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. <laughs> it's the sort of, it's the, it's the dark side of perpetual connectivity, uh, that you, you know, something's going to happen somewhere, and if you're the last to know, you are a loser. <laughs> Uh, and it's and it's you know that's that's one sort of goad for people to be perpetually connected. But the you know the problem is that they're perpetually connected. They can never take that quiet time to to surround themselves with a you know whatever solitude that they need, and that they're sort of dosing themselves with with social contact and not you know terribly comfortable being alone. Um, and so you know there's this a I mean it's a great world for a social researcher to study, but it's a world where 
you know, it, the, the classic double-edged proposition of technologies is very much in evidence. There are things that you get out of it you never could get before that are way cool, and there are things it does to your life that rearranges the molecules and are not necessarily very comfortable and stuff. Um, so there's more stuff about videos. <laughs> Um, and the big shift that you guys had to, had to adjust to in the, in the advent of, uh, of social networking in particular was to share the stage with amateurs. You, know, you guys know all this stuff. You know what's best. You know how to, how to assess whether something's right or wrong or got, got a, you know, an institutional imprimatur around it that makes sense or not, or whether it's timely or topical, whether it's the most recent thing and stuff. All of a sudden, Everybody's in the act, you know? They're trying to say things that aren't true. They're trying to post things that are demonstrably wrong and stuff. So it's an uncomfortable space. And plus, you know, there, there is, there's an upside to this. Well, you know, my, one of my teachers on this is Bill Fisher at, at the Berkman Center at Harvard, who says this is the golden age of amateur experts. It's way cool that you can go to school on any subject you care about without necessarily getting the credential. I mean, we see it all the time in our healthcare work where somebody gets a, a diagnosis and they didn't know anything the day before the diagnosis. Three days after, they're as schooled as the most um, you know, well-trained specialist in it. They've, they've read the medical literature, they've read the clinical trials and stuff. So, so it, but it's disorienting to have the old structures of authority and, and, and sort of uh, expertise now challenged by, by the fifth estate. Um, so I, you know, librarians um, can help people be in different attention zones and media zones. I'm going to just cut. I'm going to go to the last thing because I think it's a. Uh, I have five questions that I. I um, uh, they're sort of practical questions. Those are meta issues. I don't want to do that. Okay. These are five quest questions that this this age has. Um, there are meta questions, you know, that librarians have to answer, or metaphysical questions that, about what's what's the nature of knowledge, what's the nature of thinking, what's the nature of public technology, what's the nature of public spaces. I'll leave that, you know, that's that, what I was going to talk for about ten minutes on. But here, here, um, here are the practical questions I think that are worth pondering for librarians. A couple of years ago, I was briefing uh, with my colleague Tom Rosenstiel. We were briefing executives at ABC News about our findings about how people get news in different ways now, very social, very participatory, and stuff like that. And David Weston, who was then the president of ABC News, uh, said, you know, that just, just highlights the big question of our life. What's the commodity and what's the franchise? You know, what is it? He said, you know, we're institutionally, we're trying to figure out what is the single great or cluster of things that ABC News can do better than anybody else? And we should really lavish our attention and our resources on them. And the commodity piece is what do people expect from us, to, which a lot of other actors do as well as we do. Um, but we, you know, we, we owe it to our patrons to, to give them the best version of it, but as cheaply and efficiently as possible. Not, you know, so his, I mean, the fundamental question for him was, do we have a White House correspondent? The wire services cover the White House pretty well on a day-to-day -day basis. And staffing it, for, especially for a network where you've got you know, a crew to, to go along with, that's a big money proposition. And is it really day-to-day uh, -day make ABC News better um, than the AP, just reading the AP wire services on the TV that night. And it was a big struggle for him because, uh, you know, he knew that if ABC or any news organization decided to pull its White House correspondent or devote it, those resources to some other way to cover Washington, there'd be hell to pay in the journalism fraternity. Everybody would say, you're a sissy, you know, for, uh, you know, you'd be, you, this is a big show with the White House, for crying out loud. And so it's a, it's a hard question. That it's a hard question for librarians, too. Your patrons want it all from you. They want the traditional stuff. They want the new stuff. They want you to do it all. Uh, and, and, you know, new cohorts of users are making new demands on you. So f answering this question, what, what is it, what is it uniquely, what are we uniquely well positioned to do for the world and certainly for our community? And what's the other stuff that we, we, our patrons expect of us but that we can deliver with a little bit more efficiency and a little less cost than we do now? Um, there's a wonderful um, chapter title in, in Jeff Jarvis's book. Uh, his book was called What Would Google Do? And it talked about how companies, uh, traditional companies, ought to think more like Google in, in the way that they approach the world. And his, one of his chapter headings was, do what you do best and link to the rest. 
you know, somebody else is doing pretty well some of the things that you guys are doing pretty well. Well, maybe there's a new reallocation of resources to do where, you know, it becomes their major responsibility to do it, and you just point people to them. Say, you know, you trust us to give you good information and good advice and, and awareness about what's cool in the world. Well, they're the ones who are doing it. You know, we don't have to necessarily have every, you know, expert, you know, touch all, all bases in here. So I thought that was a, a cool way to frame that thought. What's the social networking play? I loved uh, that, that you guys are sort of institutionally thinking about alliances to strike. But there's a way to be thinking now about, you know, other institutions in your communities are trying to do some of the same stuff that you're doing, provide good quality information about civic life and, and things like that in the community. Maybe there are ways that you can make common cause with the local university, the local community college, the local school system, the local um, nonprofit groups who care about whatever that you care about. Um, and, and essentially um, expand your mission, but also leverage the other kinds of institutions that are available to you that are kind of trying to do um, the same thing that you are. Obviously, thinking about yourselves as nodes in individual peoples or individual communities networks is a great thing to do, I would argue, because this is a, is a networking world. But there are other ways to be thinking about, well, who else can we form alliances with uh, in our community? What's the mobile play? Um, you know, I don't actually have any great ideas about what this is for librarians, but the, but the, the desire of people to get real-time information and to assess it and make meaning out of it and sometimes make decisions based on it is growing, and it will grow even more as more real-time information falls into people's hands through social networks and, and mobile connectivity. You know, libraries have tended to be oriented around um, linear information that has been developed over time. Real-time information is hard to sort through, hard to make meaning of, and stuff like that. I, and I just wonder whether librarians, in asking these questions of, this, of themselves, could come up with some wonderful ways to help people tie into the most meaningful real-time information to help them um, navigate their lives. Fourth question is, what's the gift economy play? Um, there is a lot of scholar, not a lot, but there's, there's good, high-quality scholarship now suggesting that there is essentially a parallel culture rising up in the age of, 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 of the Internet where people aren't necessarily looking for financial reward in being content creators and being contributors and being rankers and raiders and stuff. There are other motives that are driving uh, them that are social. They're going, looking to raise their status. They're looking to burnish their reputation. They're looking to be helpful to people. They're looking maybe to, to be reciprocal, but in a way that doesn't involve exchange of money. I'll help you if you help me. And of course, in many respects, people are using social media to audition. They are looking for jobs, or they are looking for somebody to hire them in one way, shape, or form. But that isn't directly related to the things that they're posting right now. And so librarians can tap into this gift economy. Um, there are people out there that are happy to do, in many respects, things that might be helpful to you. Help you organize your stuff, help you find new stuff, help you learn about, um, help you learn about uh, new things. And, I, and, and so I'm arguing that in inviting your patrons to be co-creators of the library experience Co-decision makers, I mean, you can ask for feedback in this environment a lot more, and get it. You know, there are people who love you and will be happy to respond to your questions, and there may be some people that hate you, but will also respond to your questions. And when you've got decisions to make, the burden doesn't always fall on you entirely to know what your patrons want or to anticipate their needs. Ask them. They might tell you, and it might be useful. It might, you know, you're going to have to sort through stuff, and it's an awkward exchange potentially, but, but thinking that there are people who are willing to give you feedback and willing to help you answer questions and willing to respond to the, to the things that you are, are mulling. Where do we spend our next um, investment dollar? Where do we spend our next staff dollar? What, what, how do we burnish our collections? They'll, they'll help you sort through that stuff. And then finally, um, this is a world where the the imperfections of the metrics that used to exist can be improved. Um, there are ways now to measure things better than we used to. Um, but the, the challenge for, particularly for nonprofit institutions or public institutions, is to figure out what to measure and how to measure it. You know, you can measure audience size, okay. You can measure awareness, that's okay too. You can begin to measure engagement. 
You know, somebody who retweets you or somebody who friends the library or somebody who responds to a query about, you know, we're thinking about buying so many e-books uh, of this type, those are people who are, are, are engaged and I, arguably they are more valuable to you than just somebody who's aware of you and what you're doing. So, so thinking about new metrics of how, how you define success, what you serve, who you serve and how you serve them and stuff like that, I think that's having fundamental conversations about how you measure that, uh, especially not so much um, uh, outcomes, uh, you, you're wanting to measure out, you're not measuring outputs, you're just, you know, the volume of, of, of traffic is one important thing, but there are now new refinements that you can do on that and I'm sure you can measure it. And the reason I'm sure of that is because um, librarians are smart. And librarians care about their world and their communities in ways that I don't think many other people do. I talk to a lot of groups, and I talk to a lot of library groups, and I, I can now say with some level of, of sort of serious data collection, librarians are, are care more about being good social networkers and care more about being engaged with their patrons than anybody else I know. So, as a happy patron of, of libraries, I want to thank you for that, and I want to tell you that it's a world that um, is, is, a bit, is a bit shaky and is causing problems, but you don't have to be afraid of it if you approach it with the right frame of mind and the right level of creativity. Thanks very much.